the uh, music ministry. And now well, let's turn it our Bible. It's going to start in uh, 1 John uh, chapter 2. Actually, go to Psalm 95. Sorry, Psalm 95. I am going to do uh, one of the Psalms uh, that we uh, typically do before one of our classes. We uh, read one of the Psalms in our continued doxology and praise of God. And uh, this is a praise to the Lord and also a warning against unbelief, but a great psalm of praise to our God who is the creator of the heavens and the earth. And we find that in Psalm chapter 95. There are 11 verses in this psalm, so it's not uh, too big of a psalm. But in any case, as it says in uh, verse 1, it says, O come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods, in whose hands are the depths of the earth. The peaks of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for it was he who made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture in the sheep of his hand. Today, if you would hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as in the day of Massah in the wilderness, when your forefathers tested me. They tried me, though they had seen my work. For forty years I loathed that generation and said, They are a people who err in their heart, and they do not know my ways. Therefore I swore in my anger, Truly they shall not enter into my rest. And that's we also see in Hebrews chapter 4, where it follows up on that in the New Testament doctrine about entering into the rest of the Father. But as it says in verse 10, which also goes along with our message today, Who err in their heart. Because as we continue to study our main topic of study, which is Ephesians chapter 6 now in verses 2 and 3, and then we'll get uh, beyond that in uh, just a few weeks, or in another week, I'd say. But basically, we're talking about God's design for relationship for all of mankind. And in Psalm chapter 6, verses 2 and 3, we have the fifth of the Ten Commandments, which led us into that study of the all of the Ten Commandments. This is our 33 uh, 33rd hour that we've been talking about this, 33rd message that I'm giving on this, and we are just about to wrap it up. In fact, today I'm talking about the 10th commandment, and I'm giving the last uh, message in regard to the Old Testament usage of that commandment, and then on Thursday when we come back, I'll talk about the New Testament usage for that. And then thereafter we'll uh, do a wrap-up and conclusion of these 10 commandments. But it's been fantastic doing this study, going through it, and seeing not only how it applied to Israel as God gave these, this law and these commandments to the people and nation of Israel, but also giving it to you and I uh, for the church age, except for, as you know, uh, that uh, the, the fourth commandment. But in any case, the first commandment, you shall not have any other gods before me. Again, there is only one God, and he is the only God we should be worshiping. That's why the second commandment says, you shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them. Then the third commandment, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Again, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. The fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. That was the Saturday celebration for the people of Israel. The only commandment that's not reiterated for us in the New Testament for us to keep. Then the fifth commandment is Exodus chapter 20, verse 12. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord God gave to you. And then we see the sixth commandment, you shall not murder. And again, that premeditated type of murder in view. The seventh commandment, you shall not commit adultery. Again, sexual relationship outside of marriage with one of the individuals at least is married or engaged. You shall not commit adultery. Then we have the eighth, you shall not steal. Again, taking unlawfully the property of someone else. And then the ninth commandment was you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, which predominantly talked about in a court of law, but it's also the headline for all the scriptures that tell us about you should not lie. So lying is in view here, which is also one of the abominable uh, sins of our father. Again, God hates that sin in that list of seven in Proverbs chapter six. 
So then we get to the Tenth Commandment, which we're noting this morning. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. And in, in Exodus chapter 20, verse 17, we see this listing. And then it's, again, all the Ten Commandments are reiterated for us in Deuteronomy. And remember, Deuteronomy was 40 years later, just a, uh, before they were uh, to enter into the Promised Land. So we see some slight variations, as we have in this commandment, which I'll give to you in a minute. But it says, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. And in this commandment, it's really about coveting. And that word coveting means desiring, lusting for someone else. Again, that inordinate type of desire where you wish you had something that someone else has. You lust for the property or the belongings of someone else. And as it says here, again, your neighbor's house, again, his household. It could even include his family as well. Oh, I wish I had that family but also the wife, and that goes along with the, the committing adultery, but all of this is in the mentality of our soul. And then we talk about his workers, his employees, male and female servant, and then the work animals, again, his business that is necessary. Again, we should not be stealing in, uh, from our, our bosses or the owners of uh, companies that we may work for, his ox or his donkey. Again, we shouldn't even think about stealing or lusting for those things or desiring those things. And then we have the catch-all or anything else. Okay, Anything else that someone has, even if it doesn't hit in this list. Now, in the Deuteronomy passage that we have for this, it flips or reverses the first two. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. It says wife first, and then it goes into house there. And really talking about the wife that I is solemn unto the husband and part of uh, his relationship and that divine institution that God blessed us all with. Then it gets into the household. And then it also adds field, or we could say land as well well because remember when they were wandering in the wilderness they didn't possess land at that point in time but when they came into the promised land now God was giving them land as you know parsed out by the 12 tribes of Israel but then within that the tribes would parse out whatever land that they were giving amongst each family member so now they had land ownership so again we shouldn't desire the property that someone else owns and in this case the land ownership is in view so that's a general overview of what this commandment is all about. And as we've been talking about this, again, third lesson that we've been talking about in regard to the Old Testament application. And remember, this command doesn't talk about a specific act. As all the other commandments talked about a verbal or overt action that they could have, especially, again, in what we call the horizontal commandments, again, starting with the fifth and going all the way down to the tenth. In other words, horizontal, they affect the fellows in your community, again, your neighbor. And as you know, we should be loving our neighbor as we love ourselves and as Christ loved our na his friends, laying down his life for his friends. We should have love for our neighbor, not having these types of mental or overt or even verbal types of sins. So in any case, all the other commandments that we've talked about, especially in the horizontal plane, have been talking about, again, overt actions that we could commit with our tongue or with our body. Now we get into really the mentality of our soul and the genesis of where all sin comes from. And that's why this one, again, was given last. It kind of sums up them all, as you can even see, between, you know, coveting the wife, coveting the household, stealing, having menta uh, mental attitude in regard to taking or desiring the property of someone else, or even lying about somebody, stealing their reputation, as it were, by uh, committing gossiping, maligning, slandering. All of this has to do with the mentality of the soul. And again, we have a sin nature, as the Bible tells us. We have that old man, the old sin nature, the old self, as uh, it also calls it. <coughs> And that is a nature inside of us that tempts us into sinning, just as we have the world all around us that tries to tempt us into sinning, as Satan tried to tempt Jesus Christ as he came out of the wilderness after 40 days, tried to tempt him to follow Satan and disregard the plan that God had for himself. So temptations come from within, they come from without. But temptation is not sin. 
temptation becomes sin when the mentality of your soul runs with it. And again, you think about that act a little bit more. You covet somebody's property. You desire to have an adulterous affair with your uh, neighbor's wife or whatever the case may be. Anything that ultimately is sin comes first from the mentality of our soul. And then once our mind massages that temptation for a little bit, thinks about it, plans it out, and then creates some kind of uh, you know, plan to enact that sin, then when we act it out, either through our words and gossiping, maligning, slandering, lying, those types of things, or through our actions, again, it then becomes sin with, uh, excuse me, becomes an overt sin within our life. But it all starts with the mentality of our soul that leads us to verbal and then overt sins. So this is all about, you know, God telling us don't even have those types of desires. As we're going to see, and we've already noted when we talked about committing adultery, our Lord said in the great uh, Sermon on the Mount, he said, even if you look at a woman with lustful eyes, you've already committed adultery. So even though this one is talking about the mentality of the soul and the emotional, psychological sins that we can get into, it really has a sum of all this all the commandments and really all sin because it all starts in the mentality of our soul and that's why it's very important for us to take in the word of God on a consistent basis remain filled with God the Holy Spirit so that ultimately we have something to combat that with because if we're just left to ourselves without the word of God and without God in our lives what do we have we have ourselves we have our sin nature and we have the world that is leading us or trying to tempt us into doing all kinds of things that otherwise God would have us not do so now let's turn to first John chapter 2 and uh, specifically in verse 16. And again, this is a powerful verse. And I, as I've uh, taught on this in detail in the past, and I'm just going to mention it briefly for you this morning. But in this passage, again, this is basically Satan's great tool. And we see that, uh, you know, as John is warning us, as God is warning us through the Apostle John, giving us this information, that all this lustful desire, these temptations come from without and also within, and they lead us into sin. And this is part of Satan's plan to try to distract us. This is, as, again, as we go through this list, if you haven't seen this before, and you think about advertising in, on the TV or the magazines or in movies, and you think about how they approach the advertisement, it's all about this list of three. And in fact, when the woman was tempted by Satan in the Garden of Eden, these three things were part of that temptation that led her into the sin. When Jesus Christ was tempted coming out of the wilderness, those three temptations also had to do with these three things. So again, it's very important for us to know these things so we know our enemy and can combat that so we don't have the mentality of entering into sin so easily. And instead, we have power and strength through the Word of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit working with us to overcome these things. All right, so in verse uh, uh, 15, it goes back. It says, Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And then here in verse 16, For all that is in the world, and here we have our list of three, the lust of the flesh, And that's talking about we are inward desire. Remember, the flesh many times in Scripture is used for the sin nature, the the old Adamic nature that is inside of you, the lust of the flesh. That's the temptation coming from within. Then it goes on to say the lust of the eyes. Again, the objects that you look at, the things that you look at, and oh, how beautiful those things are. And they can fulfill that inward temptation of that lustful desire that you have from within. You see things that could fulfill that. And then it also uh, goes on to say, again, after the lust, uh, the lust of the eyes, it says the boastful pride of life. And all of this is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away, and also it's lust. But the one who does the will of God abides forever. So again, we have the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life. Again, the arrogance that we can have that says, hey, I deserve that thing. I should go out and get that thing, even though the word of God may tell me not to get that thing. Again, arrogance many times overrules God's will and plan for our lives. So we have to be aware of that. And so as we categorize these things, I like to call it appetite, beauty, and ambitious pride. You know, again, Satan tries to create an appetite of lustful desire in your soul. There's a beauty that he puts out there like he did with a woman. Oh, look at the fruit on that tree. It's gonna, it can make you wise. Ooh, isn't that good? I want that wisdom. Again, that beauty. He gives you an object that you can start to desire and, and lust and want for your own. And then
then again, the boastful pride of life. Again, beauty, appetite, and ambitious pride. Again, I deserve this thing. And again, this all goes back to what I've been telling you and teaching about from the Word of God, that we should have contentment within our lives. We should be content with what God has given us. We should be happy with God's provision. He is our uh, our provider, our caretaker. He will never leave us or forsake us. He has given us everything that He desires to give to us in this life, and there will be more. And as we walk faithfully, again, God will continue to provide for our every need and maybe even super abundantly bless us with more than what we need so that we can be charitable and giving in our lives as well. But ultimately, if we aren't trusting in God, what we're going to do is start to look at everybody else and look at everything else and start to, ooh, look at them and feel sorry for ourselves. Again, this is where the pride and the arrogance come in. Oh, why don't I have that? Oh, I deserve to have that. Why do they get this and why do they get that? Again, that's the boastful pride of life. Uh, ultimately, we should not be looking at other people with lustful eyes, desireful eyes. We should be looking at other people in love and saying, wow, did God bless them? And if they've got some good things, great. They've, you know, God has blessed them in a fantastic way. But remember, in everybody's life, yes, there are good things, but also there are bad things. And we have to keep that in mind. Uh, you know, there's no perfect life on this earth. When we get to heaven, there will be a perfect perfect life, of perfect environment, perfect mentality, perfect, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, community. But in this world, there is good and evil, good and bad. And again, just because somebody has some goods in their life, again, you shouldn't lustfully desire those things and then enter into, uh, 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 hopefully not, and take the next step and enter into some kind of other sin of verbally or uh, overtly acting that out. We should always be content with God and not give over to the temptations of Satan and his cosmic system. And again, as I said, you know, the Christmas season coming up, oh, you need this toy, you need that toy, you need this new car. I mean, this time of year, besides football games, games and you know christmas you see more car advertisements than you've ever seen before and it just makes your head spin because you need a new car at christmas time why do you need a new car at christmas time why is it always that time you know because they know that satan's got them in a spending mode and spending mode spending mode and all the advertisements get you spending and spending and spending and ultimately spending beyond your means many times and getting into debt which we should not be doing but ultimately it all comes because somebody has created an appetite within our soul And we could call it the advertisers, but ultimately we know that it comes from Satan and his cosmic system trying to lead us away from our walk and our relationship with the Lord. And as we look at this commandment, again, this may be the most innocuous of all the commandments and, again, the less egregious of all the commandments because you're really not hurting anybody else by having a mentality uh, in your soul of sin. When you think about things, again, you're not hurting someone else. You're only really sinning within your own soul. So, again, we may think of this sin as being, oh, it's, it's not too, you know, egregious here, but actually it's the most potent of them all. And it really shows us the progression, kind of in a reverse uh, fashion, coming, starting with the 10th commandment. Again, you shall not covet, lust, desire for other things. And then going, walking our way backwards between lying and stealing and ultimately uh, uh, adultery. And then what do we see? Murder. And so we see that negative progression, that spiral that really is the downward progression that someone could truly get themselves into when they don't take care of the mentality of their soul, when they don't take care of the temptation right then and there. And remember, as Jesus Christ said, every time he was tempted by Satan, he said, the word of God says. He doesn't say, I say, or, you know, this one says, or that one says. He says, the word of God says. God says, God says, God says. In other words, he's got the word in his soul to combat the temptation that is coming at him each and every day. But if we don't have that, it could lead us all the way down to a slippery slope of even committing murder because we so want something that someone else has that we would go all the way to ultimately kill them so that we could have their property. And again, there's many people in uh, prison today who have committed murder as a result of starting with a lustful desire, coveting what their neighbor has or what someone else has. But again, you may not go that far, you may not get that far, but ultimately this is the genesis of all the sins, the mentality of our soul, that coveting nature that comes you know, from, again, starting from the temptation from within, temptations that come from without but it all has to do with you making a decision god's given you a free will am i going to choose to do that thing or am i going to choose not to do that thing 
And that is our choice each and every day with our free will. And as uh, I'm going to uh, date myself here a little bit, remember Flip Wilson? I've said this before. Remember the comedian Flip Wilson back in the 70s and 80s? You know, oh, the devil made me do it. The devil made me do it. And that was his big joke. He used to say that all the time. No, it's not the devil who made you do it. You decided to do it. The devil might have tempted you, but you decided to go along with him. So the devil never makes you do anything. It's all about your free will and your volition. And basically, when we talk about ultimately seeing what these me the mentality is all about, we have to make sure that we aren't dominated by our own self-interest. Because, again, if we just think about ourselves and if we're occupied with ourselves and what I have and what I don't have and always you know, evaluating who you are or where you are compared to everyone else, you're not going to get anywhere inside of the plan of God for your life. And it's only going to lead to misery. Again, you should never have that self-evaluation in comparison to someone else. If you want to have self-evaluation, evaluate yourself in regard to your walk with God. Am I walking in righteousness? Am I keeping his word? Am I being the servant that he has desired to? Am I utilizing my spiritual gift to serve the body of Christ? Again, if you're going to be introspective, be it in regard to those things, but not in comparison to what you have or what you are compared to someone else. So again, we have to look at these things so that we aren't motivated to lust and desire after our fellow mankind. And it basically is a commandment that prohibits any desire leading to any kind of action that would then result in some kind of verbal or overt sin that hurts your fellow mankind. And that's why, again, in Romans, as we've seen many, many times and throughout the New Testament, if you love your neighbor as yourself, you fulfilled the law. You see, God, Jesus knew, and God knows, if we have love within our soul, again, we have that spiritual self-esteem, that spiritual self-confidence. And when we have love for God, and then we ultimately have love within our soul that we can express, we're not going to be doing hurtful things towards one another. And if you truly have love in your soul, the mentality of your soul is also not going to think in sinful, lustful desires that then could lead to, you know, a, a planning or uh, a, you know, working out some kind of uh, a physical or a verbal sin that you commit towards someone else. So again, if we have the right mentality, if we have love within our soul because we know that God loves us so much and he's done so much as we're going to celebrate communion this morning and think again about the cross of Jesus Christ and all that he did for us there is the sacrificial lamb. Boy, oh boy, you're not going to be thinking about, oh, I, I wish I had, you know, that car or that boat or that house or that, you know, that tree or that family or that job or that power or whatever the case. You're not going to be thinking about those things. When you're occupied with God, you aren't going to be occupied with your, you know, uh, 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 with your position or stance in this life. So again, we ought to be occupied with God so that we don't have the wrong mentality inside of our soul. And the main concern should be about having love for God as we love our neighbor, which presents all of this from happening in the mentality of our soul. And therefore, we have what? A community that also lives in peace and harmony and love with one another. You see, if a community has a bunch of you know, people running around with all kinds of lustful desires in the mentality of their soul, sooner or later there's going to be acts committed against one another, harmful and hurting to each other. But when we have, again, love towards one another because of our love for God, we're going to have a great community. And we're going to have a community of, uh, of law, a community of happiness, a community of peace, a community of protecting one another, of their privacy, their property, their belongings, and also their right to live and have a free will volition. We're going to give them a right to be the person that they want to be. And again, that's all about love, and it's all about giving grace. But again, when we have a negative aspect in regard to this commandment in our life, basically we're not going to have that harmony inside of a community. Certainly we should be having it inside the body of Christ, as you know, with your fellow believer. But when we get out of this church and we go out into the secular world, we should also be having harmony with one another in those uh, situations as well. So this commandment teaches us much about our relationship with God. And when we think about our relationship with God, again, when we aren't to be coveting and desiring this, that, or the other thing, we are instead thinking about what? Who and what God is and what God 
is doing for me, what he's done for me, what he is doing for me, and then what he's going to do for me into the future. Again, then we focus on who and what God is. When you're focusing on other people, that's going to cram uh, or, or cramp up the mentality of your soul, so you don't have time to focus on God. But when you have focus on God, that's going to cram your soul, or cramp your soul, I should say, so that ultimately you're not worried about other people and the stuff that you know this world has to offer. Again, we'll be thinking about his faithfulness to us each and every day. And again, just think about you know the faithfulness that God has had to you in your life. I think about it all the time in my life and the sins that I've committed and the, the wretchedness that I am as a, me- a member of the human race with a sin nature inside of me. Yet Jesus Christ died and suffered for me and gave me eternal life and now wants to have a personal relationship with me each and every day. Again, we should be thinking about those things and the faithfulness of God, that he will never leave us nor forsake us, and that he is there with us each and every day. We think about his goodness, how good God is, how good he is to you, how he is to me, how he is to all of us. Again, his righteousness, his justice, his fairness, all of that wrapped up in his goodness to love you each and every day. And then also the provisions that we talk about, the logistical grace blessings that God provides us with, and then also the greater grace blessings. Again, the great blessings of just having a spiritual life. I mean, you know, we all have to stop and think about that for a little bit. You have a spiritual life. You have a spiritual walk with God that the average Joe does not have. The average person, they cannot have a relationship with God because they don't believe in God. It's interesting. I could get into, uh, you know, all kinds of atheist, atheism uh, type of analogies now. And again, if you remember that, uh, that Christian movie that came out, God is Not Dead, and the whole debate there, and the atheist professor and the young uh, believer uh, a student. And basically at the end of the movie, you know, he's pushing the, uh, the uh, professor, you know, you know, uh, you know, why do you hate God so much? Why do you hate God? And he went into why he hated God and all these reasons. And then he, st- he stepped back, the student stepped back and said, how can you hate somebody that doesn't exist? You see, in the, in the inner being of even the unbeliever, they know God exists. But they ultimately are choosing to ignore him each and every day for one reason or another. But it's our job as royal ambassadors to take that inner uh, you know, uh, th- uh, thinking, that inner nature that is telling them there is a God out there, and then communicate who the God of the heavens and the earth is all about and who their Savior truly is. That's our job, to go out there. But again, going back, you have an opportunity to do that because you're a believer. You are blessed beyond imagination just because you can have a relationship with God, walk with his will and his plan, have his word, have the spirit, have Christ in your life each and every day, and then give that to other people. Again, you know, the majority of the people in the world don't have that opportunity. But you and I do because of the great relationship we have with God. And remember, let's turn now to Matthew chapter 6, verse uh, 25 and, uh, through 34. Remember that we do have that great relationship with God and that he cares for us so much that he just wants to provide the maximum that he can for us in this life. And again, continuing on in that Sermon on the Mount where, again, Jesus spoke uh, many truths to the people of Israel that are also truths that speak to us today as well. But this is a great passage in regard to faith resting in God and just trusting in Him for your provisions and for everything each and every day. So in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 25, it says, For this reason I say to you, do not be anxious for your life as to what you shall eat or what you shall drink or your body as to what you shall put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, that they do not sow, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? In rhetorical question, yes, we are. In verse 27, in which of you, by being anxious, again, worry, fear, you know, anxiety, can add a single cubit to his life's span? And I love how they go from the time measurement to the physical measurement, and we would say, who can add a single inch to their life? You know, Again, no one can add a single inch to their life. It's in God's hands when we are born and when we will die. 
So again, can add a single uh, cubit to his lifespan. And why are you anxious about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the fields grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory did not clothe himself like one of these. But if God so arrays the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more do so for you, O men of little faith? Do not be anxious then, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, with, or with what shall we clothe ourselves? For all these things the Gentiles e eagerly seek. And again, that's talking about unbelievers there when it says Gentiles. They seek these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious for tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Can I say an amen to that? <laughs> Each day has enough trouble for its own, so why worry about the next day and the next day and the next day? Again, faithfully walk in God's plan. Again, keeping the, the mandates that he gives to us. Again, these Ten Commandments are nine of them that have been reiterated for us in the New Testament, plus all the other mandates that God gives to us is what to do and what not to do during the age in which we live in. Again, uh, understand those things and apply those things walking faithfully in your relationship with God and then in relationship to one another. At Psalm chapter 119 uh, verse 97 and again this is a praise that we should all have in regard to the giving of the word of God as we just read. How I love your instruction. It is my meditation all the day long. And again, that's what we should be doing, meditating on the Word, meditating on the Word. Because if you're not meditating on the Word, you're going to be meditating on what? Things and stuff and people and the world and all these other things that are just going to, again, are designed to create that lustful nature and desire inside of you that then leads you to various types of o overt acts that are in disobedience to God and His Word. So again, we should all be praising how fortunate we are to have the Word of God and how much we should be loving the Word of God. Again, your instruction, again, the Word of God, and we should be meditating it in our day. As God warned uh, the Israelites in Deuteronomy chapter 7 in verse 25. Let's turn there now. Let's go there uh, again to the front part of the uh, uh, Bible. Again, the fifth book of the Pentateuch. Again, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, then Deuteronomy in chapter 7. And remember, this chapter 7 comes soon after our Lord had given the Ten Commandments. And in regard to that, again, we kind of see a combination of mandates. We kind of see the first and second commandments also tied in with now this tenth as we see God warning the Israelites not to covet the silver and gold on the idols of the pagan nations that they were conquering as they came into their promised land, or even the ones they didn't conquer. Again, as they conquered those, again, you know, to the victor, you know, goes the spoils. Ultimately, they would take all of their foreign idols. And many of them were uh, adorned with gold and silver, or even sometimes uh, jewels or precious gems. But God is warning them not to lust for the gold and silver on the idols. And it's interesting. I mean, we already know the first commandment, have no other God and don't make any idols. But they, so if they were honest, you know, to that and fulfilled that, they would take all these idols, melt them down, and then have the gold and silver that they could use. Now, you know, there's nothing wrong with utilizing that gold and silver, but the commandment is what? Don't covet it. Don't have your tongue hanging out like a dog, ready to, you know, eat the bone or whatever the case. And, oh, I want that, I want that, I want that. Look at the gold, look at the silver. Wish, wish I had that, wish I had this. Ultimately, God will give it to you if God desires it for you. So he warns them not to go after those things and bring it into their house even. Because, again... If you take that temptation that then uh, ed ends up in an overt act, you'll bring that thing into your house and have that gold and silver that then occupy the mentality of your soul rather than meditating on the Word of God. And you could even go to the next step where you keep the idol intact and maybe you'd start to worship that idol as well. Joshua 7 also speaks to this uh, in a specific act once they got into the promised land, once Jericho was destroyed. But in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 25 and 26, it says, The graven images of their gods you are to burn with fire. You shall not covet the 
silver or gold that is on them, nor take it for yourself. So again, he doesn't even want him to take it here in this case. Or you will be snared by it, for it is an abomination to the Lord your God. You shall not bring an abomination into your house, and like it come under the banner. You shall utterly detest it, and you shall utterly abhor it. It is, or for it is, something banned. So again, he just wanted them to destroy that uh, idol that they had uh, back in the day and have nothing to do with it or what was fashioned from it or how it was fashioned whatsoever. And as I said, Joshua also, a, a fellow by the name of Achan, also uh, was tempted by this and had uh, a break of the covenant as a result. The prophet Micah also condemns coveting the houses and fields of their fellow neighbor, lusting after the things that other people have. As Micah says, they covet fields and they seize them in house and take them away. So again, you see, it starts with the mentality of the soul that it can lead to some kind of overt action, in this case, stealing, taking them when they rightfully do not belong to you. They rob a man and his house, a man and his inheritance. And again, Micah warns against doing that, so we should not be entering into that as well. Proverbs also warns against, again, the adulterous woman and not lusting and desiring after her beauty. Do not desire her beauty in your heart, nor let her capture you with her eyelids. For on account of a harlot, one is reduced, and I love this, to a loaf of bread. <laughs> That's how you are, just a dumb loaf of bread that you know, goes into the mouth and gets passed out, and you know, you know what happens there. But in any case, it's all it is. And an adulteress hunts for the precious life. Okay? She's trying to take your stuff away from you. Again, it's not you. She wants your stuff, basically, in that situation. So again, reduced to a loaf of bread. Then we also see in Proverbs chapter 4, in verse 23, Watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. And that heart, again, as we have uh, in the Hebrew and also in the Greek, again, talking about not the blood pumping organ, but the mentality of your soul, the innermost being of your soul. Again, that's where your life flows from. And if that heart is corrupted with uh, evil and sin and uh, lustful desires and coveting uh, uh, your neighbor's things and stuff, basically, again, what's going to flow from that heart? The same. The same's going to flow. But ultimately, if you have righteousness in your heart, if you have the love of God in your heart, then from that heart will flow righteous justice, love, and you will care for your neighbor, provide for your neighbor, protect your neighbor as you should, as, as well as their property and their belongings. So... Again, the Word of God tells us time and time again not to envy, not to desire, nor even take away the things that our fellow mankind has. Again, his home, his wife, his land, his servants, uh, workers, we would say, his livestock, you know, things of his business, ultimately, or anything else that he owns. Again, we should not get into that mentality of anything uh, that someone else has that we start to lust and desire, again, occupy ourselves with. Oh, I wish I had this. I wish I had that. Or feeling sorry for ourselves. Why don't I have this? And why don't I have that? Basically, we aren't to have any of that type of mentality in our soul. And God gives us this command because he knows the sin nature. He knows Satan and his cosmic system. He knows the temptations that we will be affected with each and every day. And he wants to give us the power and strength to overcome these things. And he doesn't just say, don't do these things, which again is good enough, like the, you know, the two-year-old child, you know, don't do this and do that. And again, you have to start in immaturity in the spiritual walk with do's and don'ts. But then later on, as we grow to maturity, then what does Jesus say and what does God say? Love your neighbor as you love yourself. So it becomes a greater lifestyle, a greater mentality that we are to have. And the do's and don'ts, yeah, have them in your soul so that works and gives you that quick little bit of information. I, the Word of God says not to. The Word of God says do. Uh, so I will do. And ultimately with that, we can go forward. But then as we grow in spirituality and we grow in our relationship with God, we start to have a greater perspective of other people that are around us and the servant heart that we should have as royal priests and royal ambassadors, our relationship with God. And we have that all in the mentality of our soul. And now we function in that with our overt and verbal actions. We use our words to encourage, uh, to lift up, reprove and rebuke if necessary. We use our actions to help uh, you know, uh, other people in, in situations, to provide in a giving way where we can. Again, if we have the heart of love, we will have the body and uh, 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 words of love as well within our lives. 
And as uh, we wrap this up, and then I just got some conclusionary points, and I got a little video I'm going to show you. I promised the video. I'm sure you've all seen it, but just wanted to show it to you once again. But in Exodus chapter 34, verse 24, God said to the people of Israel, if they were faithful to him and they continued to walk in his statutes, basically he would stop all other nations from coveting what they had. And remember, God blessed them incredibly through David and then Solomon and all the riches and all the gold that he had. I mean, Solomon had so much gold and silver that he was making you know, a, a weaponry and shields out of that material. Could you imagine our country going out and making guns of gold for every soldier that was out there? Again, how much would that cost? We're already paying billions of dollars for what we have. Could you imagine if everything was made out of gold? I mean, your head would just spin, but God blessed Israel so much that they could do those things. And at the same time, God said, I'll protect you. And the same thing goes for our nation. The same thing goes for you and I and your own family. Again, if you walk faithfully, no one else is going to covet the things that you have. And then again, with that covetousness, take the next step to take the things that you have, uh, you know, uh, um, Steal, rob, uh, you know, malign, slander, lie. They won't do any of those things against you. God will protect you. Even though, try as they might, God will put that wall of fire as hedge around you, so ultimately you too will be protected. And so in Exodus tw- uh, 34, 24, For I will drive out nation before you and enlarge your borders, and no man shall covet your land when you go up three times a year to appear before the Lord your God. So again, that was a picture of their faithfulness back in the day. You go up on the... Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Passover, again, same time period. You go up on Pentecost, you go up on the Feast of Booze, also called Tabernacles. You go to Jerusalem and, you know, give your sacrifice at the temple. That was their demonstration of their salvation and their faith in God. And so, again, we don't have to go to Jerusalem and commit our sacrifice three times a year, but we walk faithfully each and every day. And we demonstrate that in our words, in our actions, all starting in the mentality of our soul. Because as we've already seen in this discussion, basically God doesn't look at the outward appearance of a man, but he looks at his heart. He looks at the innermost being of a man, and he knows who and what you are based on the mentality of your soul. And so if you're feeling a little bad about that, well, you've got the Word of God to help you out so that you can have Bible doctrine resonant within your soul and walk in God's righteousness each and every day. So let me just conclude real quick with these things in our Old Testament uh, 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 usage of this commandment. Again, it may have been possible for someone, you know, to not commit any of the other nine commandments. You know, you know, you're not murdering, you're not stealing. Most of us don't murder. Most of us don't steal. We don't, uh, you know, lie in a court of law. We don't commit adultery. We worship God. We don't have other gods. You know, it's easy for most people to commit, you know, not commit the nine out of the uh, uh, nine out of the first. Uh, excuse me. The first nine out of the ten. But there's not a one of us here that can't say, I've never committed the tenth commandment, okay? Because everybody has this sometime in the mentality of their soul. Again, when the soul, again, is tempted in some way, at some point or another, we've all committed it. But that's okay, because we know that our Lord died for our sins. In 1 John 1, 9, we confess those sins and walk faithfully in Him once again. But again, this also gives us, again, that last bit of fortitude for our soul because yeah okay maybe you're not doing all these overt actions now let's work on what's going on in the mentality of your soul let's go there and so again it may be the least of all these sins as i said it's the least injurious the least violent to the community to your neighbor but yet is the commandment that is at the root of all disobedience because it all comes from the mentality of your soul every sin So again, we have to be aware of this and uh, recognize this ninth of the Ten Commandments because it is the most forceful of all. Again, it tells us about our inability to keep God's law perfectly within our lives. Now remember, the Israelites were to keep the whole Mosaic law. For the church age, we know that Christ has fulfilled the law, but many of the principles, like these nine of the Ten Commandments, are given to us again for the age in which we live in. And we are to keep them. And again, we don't keep the whole Mosaic law, as you know, but the law of God, which is the greater mandates, is even is, as we talked about, there's 300 mandates in the New Testament for you and I to keep. Okay? And when we look at 300, can, can I really do that? And the answer is no, you can't. 
you can do your best and we should do our best to walk in righteousness and not sin. And we shouldn't just, you know, be uh, laissez faire about it and say, oh, whatever, maybe, you know, okay, sirrah, sirrah, if I sin, I sin, if I don't, I don't. You know, we don't a- operate like that, okay? <laughs> but we do have an inability to keep the, law of the laws and the mandates of God perfectly. But that's okay because it gives us, as it gave Israel, a great awareness of their inefficiency and God's great sufficiency. It gave them a great awareness of their lack, but God's provision. It gave them great uh, awareness of God's grace, His mercy, and His love that they needed to depend on in order to walk in His plan. And that's what God's Word does for all of us. It gives us that information so that we have a dependency upon Him. And we should operate that way because, again, in and of myself, we cannot do it. But with God, we can. We can be overcomers. And we can be victorious not only in salvation, but in our daily walk, just as God desires us to be. And just as God desires us to do, to focus on His grace and His mercy and rely upon that within our lives. He's paid for our sins. He's given us salvation. Again, 1 John 1, 9, we can confess those sins. He gives us the filling of the Holy Spirit so that we can walk in the light of God. And as 1 John tells, and Ephesians 5, walk in fellowship with Him. We can walk with God when we are utilizing His power and His strength, His grace and His mercy within our lives. All right, so that uh, concludes our utilization of this commandment in the Old Testament. And uh, before I get to the next portion of our service, I wanted to share with you a little video that I just wanted to bring up. And uh, those online may not uh, be able to hear all of this. But if you all remember this movie, The Ten Commandments. you got to love Charlton Heston.
right. I'm sure you've all seen that movie before, <laughs> but again, just a good reminder of that. And uh, I, I find it fascinating that uh, God speaks in uh, King James English. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thou shalt not die. <laughs> but again, uh, a good video, good reminder of uh, who and what our God is and what he has given, uh, gave to the people of Israel and also has given to us as a way to worship him and glorify him and uh, also uh, uh, you know, love and worship our fellow neighbors as well. So uh, let's just uh, bow our heads in prayer right now. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time. We praise you. We glorify you. We thank you for your word that is so powerful and uh, uh, gives us strength in our lives each and every day. And we thank you for these mandates that you have given to us, uh, even for our age that we live in, Father, that we walk in your will, we walk in your plan to glorify you more and more each and every day as we better love our neighbor as you have loved us. So, Father, we thank you for this time, and we ask that you be with us in the closing portions of our service. In Christ's precious name, amen. All right, and if you want, uh, if keep your Bibles open, and let's turn to Isaiah 53. Let's go to Isaiah 53. And as we, let me go back to my slides here. <coughs> so again, in this portion of our service, we are taking of the uh, bread and the wine of our Lord and Jesus Christ, and I welcome you all to participate in this. Uh, ultimately, it's a remembrance of uh, who and what God is and what Jesus Christ did for us upon the cross to pay the penalty for our sins. And as we have here in John chapter 1, verse 29, again, behold the Lamb of God, which has taken away the sins of the world. And that's why we come together to celebrate and worship our God. So uh, let's prepare to take out the, uh, uh, pass out the communion elements, have the music ministry. I guess uh, Mary Ellen's going to sing a song. And uh, George and Gary, you mind passing out the elements for us today? And with that, Mary Ellen also has a video that I want to share with you while she sings. And let's just uh, pray for this portion of our service. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to celebrate your son, Jesus Christ, and his fantastic work on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins through which we have eternal life. And Father, we ask that you lead us to listen to the words of this song and meditate on our relationship with you and what your son, Jesus Christ, has accomplished on our behalf. In Christ's name, amen. to glorify the Father, born to wear the thorns for peace. There's a rose in Bethlehem, colored Blood. 
is the flower of our faith. Tis the blossom of God's love. Oh, its bloom is fresh with you. Surely what will be, he knows. For a tear of morning dew is rolling down. to glorify the Father, born to wear the thorns for me. There's a rose in Bethlehem with a beauty quite divine. Perfect in this world of sin, on this silent holy night. Oh, Rose of Bethlehem, how lovely, pure, and sweet, born to glorify the Father. Thank you, George and Gary, for passing out the uh, communion elements, and also Mary Ellen for the song, beautiful and moving as always. So thank you very much. Appreciate that. So uh, again, uh, you know, once a month uh, we come together traditionally to uh, celebrate communion, uh, and again from uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11 that we've been given to celebrate this until our Lord does return. But we come together to remember Jesus Christ and his work upon the cross, again through the bread and the wine that has been given to us. And as I have on the board, which I've read already in uh, John chapter 129, again, John the Baptist spoke these words when Jesus came to be baptized by him, and again pointing him out uh, from the crowd, again, behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. And going back to the Old Testament imagery of all the sacrifices that God commanded them to uh, commit, all were pointing to the work of Jesus Christ that he ultimately would uh, fulfill for us uh, or do and perform upon the cross so that our sins would be paid for. But I also like this picture too because it shows the tomb with an open door because, again, it does, doesn't end with the death, but it ultimately culminates in life. And we all have life in God because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. But Isaiah uh, chapter 53, and really going back into uh, chapter 52, towards the end of it, is a fantastic passage of prophecy of Jesus Christ and what he would do for us upon the cross. And more so than any other Old Testament passage does it explain in, in a condensed form everything that Jesus Christ would go through to arrive at that cross. And an interesting fact is that in the Jewish Bible, or if you even wanted to say the Hebrew Bible, which is just the Old Testament, basically they have removed Isaiah 53 from their Bibles because they don't want to face this uh, word and this doctrine and this prophecy when they read the book of Isaiah. So it's very interesting if you were to pick up a Hebrew Bible. Again, some may have it, but uh, from what I understand, the majority do not have it because they want to avoid what Jesus Christ has done. And if they do have it, then they give an analogy. Well, this is suffering Israel, not the suffering Christ. So again, uh, that is out there, but it is in our Bibles, and we do understand what Jesus Christ did for us. Going back to Isaiah 52 and verse 13. 
It says, Behold, my servant will prosper. He will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted. Just as many were astonished at you, my people, so his appearance was marred more than any man. In other words, he was disfigured beyond anybody uh, that had been crucified before. It says, In his form more than the sons of men. Thus he will sprinkle many nations. Kings will shut their mouths on account of him. For what had not been told them, they will see. And what they had not heard, they will understand. And that really, those, th those verses really go forward to the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But ultimately, the first coming is found at the beginning. Now in chapter 53, it says, Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Again, who's, who have we witnessed to? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot. Again, the shoot of the son of Jesse being David. And like a root out of, the uh, out of a parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty. Again, he wasn't born into the throne of Herod. He was born into a manger, as we know, and as we have depicted in our manger here in the church in Bethlehem, and basically out of a parched ground because there wasn't a lot of truth and uh, faith going on in Israel at that time when he came. No appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. Again, the crucifixion in view there. He was crushed for our iniquity. The chastening of our well-being fell upon him. In other words, uh, the, our sins. And by his scourging, we are healed. Again, the suffering that he had on the cross. And it wasn't the physical suffering, but as you know, the spiritual suffering when he took on our sins. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Again, there is not one without sin, as we see in the New Testament. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to a slaughter and like a sheep that, that is silent before its shearers. So he did not open his mouth. But, and again, when he was in the trials before the Pharisees and uh, Herod, we see this in operation. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due? And again, that last, you know, the generation who considered that he was cut out uh, from the land. Again, that's all talking about rejecting or the rejection of him by his people. His grave was assigned with a rich man, or uh, excuse me, assigned with wicked men. That's when he was there up on the hill with uh, the two thieves. Yet he was with a rich man in his death, the, ch the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. Because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth, no sin of his own, yet he paid for us. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. He will uh, prolong his days in the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. And by his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify many. And again, all who believe are justified by him. As he will bear their iniquities, but he, he bared the sins of the entire world, as we know. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great. He will divide the booty with the strong. And that's you and I, again, uh, you know, uh, the, the family of God in the church age that we live in. And he was numbered with the transgressors, yet he himself bore the sins of many, or the sin of many, and intercedes for the transgressors and again bore the sin of many that singular sin talking about our uh, sin nature and the spiritual death that is given to us through adam uh, passed down from generation to generation again the sin of unbelief so basically we have jesus christ who bore our sins took on the sins of the entire world so ultimately we would not have to there is no human good works that we could perform, no deeds that we could do, no offerings, attendance to church, or anything else that could uh, overcome our sins. But what Jesus Christ did is the lamb that was slayed, again, again, taking away the sins of the entire world. What he did for us, did it all. 
And that one sacrifice of Jesus Christ was all sufficient for every member of the human race. And as you know, whoever so show should believe or shall believe in him would have eternal life and would not perish. You and I have received that eternal life because we believed in Jesus Christ and his suffering sacrifice for our sins upon the cross so, that there, uh, so our sins would be paid for. So when we come together again once a month, and we'll do it again on uh, our Christmas Eve special service and periodically from time to time, when we come together, we eat the bread, we drink the cup to remember the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this body which has been sacrificed for us, again, this matzah cracker without yeast, without sin, pierce, holds, bruising, talking about the body, get great physical description of what he went through prior to going to the cross and then being nailed to that cross so that ultimately he could suffer for our sins while he was there. So in celebration of that perfect body of Jesus Christ, the spotless lamb, we eat the bread. And then we have the cup that Jesus gave in that great upper room discourse in the night in which he was betrayed, going to the cross the next morning. He took the cup and he said, this is the blood of the new covenant. And again, this is my blood which is shed for you. And Jesus Christ, yes, he shed literal blood, but it's not the literal blood that saves us. This blood speaks of the sacrifice when our sins were put into him and judged by God the Father when he cried, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And it's that sacrifice that this blood represents that we commemorate to our Lord in thanksgiving for paying for our sins. So again, in thanksgiving to our God and our Lord, let us drink the cup. And then as Jesus uh, I said, and Paul reiterates again, continue to do this and, and, uh, in remembrance of me until my return. So let's bow our heads in prayer right now. Father, again, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, and we thank uh, your son who is now seated at your right hand in eternal glory, who has demonstrated victory over sin through his resurrection life. We thank you, Father, for that life that now is given to us individual believers because of his work upon the cross. And even though we have faith, Father, that faith is non meritorious, but it's all about believing in the work of your Son, Jesus Christ, which was accomplished for us. And so, Father, we thank you for your great plan. We thank you for your Son and his obedience to follow that plan and to take on our sins. And we thank you for the Holy Spirit who sustained him while he was on that cross so that he could bear our sins and the evil that we commit. So, Father, we thank you for our eternal salvation through him. In Christ's precious name, amen. All right, and if you'd like to pass your cups to the aisle, they'll be collected. <coughs> All right, and uh, the next portion of our service, we're going to collect an offering uh, this morning, and then um, we'll close with our final two songs. But uh, now is our time. Uh, to give to meet the needs of our local assembly and continue to preach the word through this uh, church and uh, so that the word of God goes out into a lost and dying world. So again, uh, in appreciation for what God has given to us, uh, let us just pray for this offering. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to give to you and we ask that you take all that we are able to give to your work and to your service through this local assembly. And Father, we thank you for the blessings of being able to give and the great blessings you've poured out onto us, and now we offer some of them back to you, to your glory. In Christ's name, amen. <clears throat>